Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. From God the Father who created us with his word. God the Son who has redeemed us with his blood. And God the Holy Spirit who brings us to faith and grows us in our faith through the word and through the sacraments. Lesson for today is today's gospel lesson. The man who had the demons dri driven out of him begged Jesus, let me go with you, let me follow you. But Jesus said to the man, no, return to your home and tell your neighbors, tell your family, tell your friends the great things that God has done. And this is without a doubt the very word of our God as it is found for us in Luke chapter 8. Well, today's gospel lesson is a spectacular account in one sense. It takes place in an area where many Gentiles lived. This is uh, certainly borne out by the fact that a large herd of pigs is being tended to. Historically, this was also a place in Jesus' day where we know that there was a lot of demon possession. And so here you have Jesus going into this area, this pagan area. He goes there to away from the synagogues, away from the children of Israel, and here in this place, he brings God's power, uh, God's power to heal a pagan man. You know, in many respects, it is a spectacular account, and sometimes you can focus on the pigs so much that you miss the real meaning of this lesson. This man who Jesus meets is a real man, but he is in dire straits. First of all, he's running around naked. He lives among the dead. He lives in cemeteries. He uh, literally is chained up, not only to protect himself from cutting himself with sharp stones, but the people are afraid of him. They chain him up, but the demons break the chains, and he goes to this solitary place. In many respects, he kind of reminds me of some other people that Scripture talks about. Remember, people who had leprosy were outcast. Uh, they couldn't come around other people. But today's lesson shows us in a real powerful and meaningful way how Christ loved this battered and defeated man. You know, I think the real lesson in this particular section of Scripture it's a miracle, a physical miracle, as Jesus brings healing, but it's also, and most importantly, a spiritual miracle. And how eventually this uh, demon-possessed man would become an agent for God's love, passing the love and the mercy of God onto other people. Sort of like a chain reaction. You know, when God's love reaches your heart, when it touches your heart, you can't help but be a changed person. You can't help but tell other people the great things that God has done. You know, with so many lessons in Scripture, sometimes you can read the lesson and yet can't make sense of it. I think one of the keys, especially with the miracles of Jesus, is that you somehow have to put yourself in this account. You know, what part would you play? Probably you wouldn't want to play the part of the pigs. Probably you wouldn't even want to play the part of the Gerasians. The Gerasians were pagan people. They went around complaining and belly aching about what Jesus had done. And so that leaves two options. You could play the part of Jesus or you could play the part of this demon-possessed man. The one whom Jesus said in verse 39, Go back to your home and tell your family, tell your friends, tell your neighbors the great things that God has done. Again, it would be tough to play that part. I mean, first of all, he's naked, but his situation is dire. He's an outcast. He lives in cemeteries. He lives among tombs. He is possessed. And again, he's kept away from other people. He's also self-destructive. The demons have literally hijacked this person. They have hijacked not only his body, but his mind, and they have hijacked his voice. 
and we think that we have it bad at times. This account tells us that this man is helpless, hopeless to do anything about his situation. He's helpless to do anything to free himself. Now the question for us this morning is this. Do we face such opponents? Do we face such adversaries in our life? And our initial reaction may be, no. You know, I think uh, we could probably say, you know, we, we are not involved in anything near this. And yet, in many respects, we're involved in a battle. We're involved in a very real battle. Every day, whether we want to admit it or not, we're involved in spiritual warfare. And God's Word warns us very specifically, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, He says to us what? Be on the alert. For your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. You know, whatever forces manifested themselves in the human race in Jesus' day certainly have their own counterparts in our day and age. For example, how is it that an upright and a godly nation, a godly culture, can quickly turn into one of cruelty and godlessness? You know, sometimes when you watch the nightly news and you watch what people do to other people, when you watch what people do to even those who have no voice of their own, those who are helpless, the unborn, you'd have to say that it's almost demonic. It is demonic. Question is, are we ready to admit that life, despite all of its helps, from health and education and government and security. The fact of the matter is, we still have forces that rip at us and tear at us, forces that are too big for us to handle. Now, perhaps we're not ready to admit this at all. Perhaps we're happy with the status quo, with the way things are. But the fact of the matter is, we're like this man in the story. We are helpless. You know, sometimes I think even the organized church has this misconception that they really don't need a full-time God, but rather they're content with a part-time God. Kind of like a God who is like a jack-in-the-box. A God that you can hide away most of the time, who won't bother you, but you can crank him up when you really need him. Now, the fact of the matter is, whether we want to admit it or not, we need him all of the time. Every moment, every hour, every second. So may God help us to see the emptiness of our own power. So the good news of this lesson is this. This demon-possessed man has a liberator. A liberator, a redeemer, who goes to work on his behalf. Think about it. Jesus, on this particular day, aimed all of God's power at this devilish spirit. He didn't merely request that the demons leave him, but he commanded them to leave. And then the demons, what do they do? They say to this Jesus, they're afraid of this Jesus, this Son of God. Isn't it interesting that the devil knows exactly who Jesus is. Jesus has got about 76 different names in Scripture that describe his life and his ministry. But you know the devil, every time the devil refers to Jesus throughout Scripture, he always calls, he always calls Jesus by his proper title. He always calls him the Son of God. He knows who he is, but he does not trust in him for salvation. Jesus asked these demons, what is your name? And what do they say? Legions. And then they ask permission of Jesus. Don't send us to the abyss. Don't send us to hell. Instead, permit us to enter into these pigs. Now some commentators in Mark's Gospel suggest that this herd of pigs could have numbered in the thousands. 
Jesus gives them permission to enter into the pigs. And they run over the cliff and they end up drowning in the sea. To me, this is a foretaste of what is going to happen in the last days. When the devil himself is cast into the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. This particular account also shows in the pig's death that the devil is intent on destroying God's good creation. Again, though, note the total helplessness and hopelessness of this man. He has a condition for which only Jesus can rescue him. And I believe that this really is a vivid picture of our own life in sin. By nature, we are born what? Sinful and unclean. Spiritually blind, the Bible says. Spiritually dead. Even enemies of God. Oh, the devil would seek to convince us that we could save ourselves if we just work a little harder. If we do enough good things to balance out the bad things that we've done. You know, if you think about it, there's really only two religions on the face of the earth. There's God's and there's man's. God gives us heaven as a gift. The religion of man is a do religion. The religion of Christianity is really a done religion. God has done everything necessary for our salvation. That's why Jesus said from the cross on Good Friday, it is finished. There is nothing that you can add to what I've already done for you. Simply receive it as a gift. And then live your faith joyfully. Again, thank God Jesus has taken our sins on himself, carried them to the cross, he died in our place, and then he rose again from the dead as the absolute guarantee that his resurrection is the first of many resurrections to come, including yours, and including mine, and including all who put their faith and trust in him. Jesus is able to set us free from the power of the evil one who seeks to enslave us. Sets us free from all kinds of things, from sin and despair, from worry and doubt and fear. Set us free from ourselves. So let me ask you a personal question this morning. What's tormenting you? You know, what seeks to shackle and chain you? You know in your own life that there is no heavier chain than those things in which torment you from the inside. You know, there's chains all over the place. But now watch the riveting account of the gospel, of Jesus going to work. If you want to see God's power at work in your life, then look no further than the empty cross and the empty tomb. You know, we could end this account right here. But uh, there's one more lesson for this account that's powerful. Or as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. You know, when the Gerasians in this pagan area saw what happened to this man, when they saw that he was dressed and now in his right mind, they were afraid. They were fearful. They were fearful, not of the man, but they were fearful of who? They were fearful of the liberator. They were fearful of the redeemer. They were fearful of Jesus. And what did they tell Jesus? They told Jesus to get lost. Get out of here. It's interesting. We all know what the word afraid means. We all know what the word fear means. Do you realize that the word afraid or fear in the original Greek means to stand in awe of something. It's the kind of uh, same word that Peter uses when he sees the large catch of fish. Fear. You know, it's my belief that there's a lot of people in the world who are afraid of Christ. They know there's something missing in their life, and they're quick to discount Jesus, they're quick to discount everything that he has done to set us free. They come up with all kinds of arguments and all kinds of silly excuses, but ultimately they are afraid of him. 
And that makes them also afraid of you. Many times, they're afraid of what you believe in and why you believe it. And so sometimes they will refer to you as two bubbles off center. That's my own line. Anyway, they're afraid. They think that you're crazy. You're a kook. You mean you believe and you trust in a God who lived and died and rose again for you? Absolutely. They're afraid of that. You know, what's the reaction of this man who was healed? He wants to follow Jesus. I mean, that's what happens when God's love reaches and touches your heart. You can't help but respond. You want to do something extraordinary. That's what he wants to do. He wants to follow Jesus the rest of his life. Now, I've asked Pastor Don this morning. I'm actually pulling a Pastor Don on you today. Because he usually calls on me during a sermon. So I'm going to call on him to explain to you the rest of the story of what happens next. Pastor Don. So, about 35 years after this particular event, when Jesus healed this man of, uh, from the demons, uh, the uh, Jewish people revolted against Rome, and the Roman armies then marched into uh, Palestine, destroying one city after another, and they were marching to Jerusalem, uh, preparing to destroy it. Uh, at that time, there were many Christians living in Jerusalem who were Jewish people. They were Jewish believers in Jesus. And so they had to make a decision. Do they stay in Jerusalem uh, and fight the Romans, or do they leave? They believed that Jesus was wanting them to leave uh, the city of Jerusalem. So within a matter of just a few weeks, they became refugees. And they had to leave their hometowns, and where would they go? Most of them went to the area of the Gerizines, uh, which today lies on the border of Jordan and Syria. They decided to go there, even though it was a Gentile region, because there was a thriving Christian community in that whole area. Much of it had become Christian, non-Jewish Christians. And they welcomed the Jewish Christians from Jerusalem who were refugees, welcomed them to their area. How did that group, how did that country become Christian? Through a man who once had been demon-possessed and now told people what God had done for him. What a powerful lesson. That's why I love Pastor Don. He's had so much insight into the rest of the story behind Scripture. You know, what a powerful lesson for each of us. You know, we don't have to argue people into the faith. We don't have to twist their arms. You can tell the love and the story of Jesus Christ in your own words and your own actions. I mean, seriously, how can somebody really argue with your testimony? How can someone argue with you about what Jesus Christ has done for you? Again, Christ's love covers us. His blood covers us. He gives us the gift of forgiveness and eternal life. He speaks to us today. He lays hold of our heart, and he gives us faith and trust in him. Again, God's love is to be like a chain reaction. And you know, this is summertime. And summertime is a great time to tell others the great things that God has done for you. It's summertime. People are outdoors. So pray, pray, pray that God would give you an opportunity to go home, to tell your family, to tell your neighbors, to tell your friends, to tell your children the great things that God has done for you. That's the good word from Christ our King on this day. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We say thank the Lord and sing his praise. Tell everyone what he has done. And Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, 
Help us tell the great things that you have done through the life, death, and powerful resurrection of your Son to set us free, to liberate us, and to give us a certain future. We pray and we ask this in your name and all of God's people said, Amen.